Hello, and welcome to another Space Foundation Space Commerce Entrepreneurship Interview. I'm Lee Steinke with Space Foundation. Today, I have the privilege of talking with independent artist and designer, Dr. Nian Ong. Thank you for joining us today, Nian. Hi, how are you, Lee? I'm great, thank you. Okay, how are you? you? I'm very well. Dr. Nian Chan Ong is an industrial designer, design researcher, and artist. He has given himself a mission to make cool stuff and has been following that mission since 2005. As a result, Nian has won several major design awards for products in aerospace, healthcare, and camping. In addition to being an independent designer and artist, Nian is also a senior design researcher at Monash University's Design Health Collab, where he oversees the design of high impact healthcare products and services. Nian completed his industrial design PhD in 2018, and his work looked into improving the in-flight sleep of economy class passengers through the design of the aircraft cabin. Some of Nian's most notable awards include Creative Victoria's Creator Fund, Melbourne International Arts Festival, Art Trams, the Teague PhD Design Research Scholarship, Casey Hyun Industrial Design Graduate Award, and Carl Nielsen Professional Development Award. He holds degrees from the Art Institute of Seattle, the University of Technology Sydney in Australia, and Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Nian, can you explain the difference between art and design and tell us about your work on both fronts? <laughs> yeah, no, we're, I guess we're coming out swinging with the hardest question of the, <laughs> of, uh, of the night. Um, that, right, like that's, so that's something that we've been debated, we've been debating forever. Um, and I don't think there is a knockdown answer. And just when we thought things were getting clearer, things become messy again off that front. But I I am actually, the way I look at it is, I, I see art as sort of the, the grandfather or the grandmother of, of it all, right? Like the our desire to express ourselves, so we start there. But starting from there, like how do we wanna express ourselves become a, a second sort of category that we come into? Is it an expression based solely on what I want to say? Is it an expression based on what you want someone to learn? Or is it an expression that's meant to change something that you do? Is it an expression that's meant to make you a little bit of money? And I think that's when we start coming into where it might start going into design. But one very, very important, I think, aspect that, that comes into this argument, and still today, is, is the presence of the client. Is it an audience or a client that you have in front of you? And, and I think that's one of the biggest questions that, that separate, is it art or is it design? Wonderful. Um, you always have such thoughtful answers, and that was no different. And you also have a fascinating story that crosses several oceans. Would you share more about your background with our audience? Yeah. Um, well, I was born in Myanmar, uh, Burma. I, I think most Americans would still refer to Myanmar as Burma. Uh, and the question comes up a lot on whether or what it should be. And I'll just quickly say that I'm one of the generations who you, and who grew up using both terms. So they mean the same thing to me. Um, but whether I say Myanmar or Burma, it represents everybody who, who's over there, not just one group of people. Um, I was born in Myanmar and I came to America, uh, Bay Area, for high school. And so all my formative years I spent in America. And after the Bay Area, that's when I, that's when I learned that I wanted to be an industrial designer. Actually, at first I thought I wanted to be a car designer. So I moved to Seattle to go to the Art Institute of Seattle. And, and that's where I kind of realized, I got an internship and everything for car design. And I realized um, I, I like cars, but I don't like them that much. I, in fact, it's design that I like. I was just young and I thought cars were cool. So I started moving more into industrial design and that's been my focus since. Um, right, after, right after my uh, associate's degree, that's when actually right on topic, uh, the commercialization of space is becoming a real question and a, and a real thing that many people are starting to pursue. 
there was a company in Bremerton called uh, Liftport Group. Many of you may be familiar with Michael Lane already at this point. Michael came to our graduation ceremony and Michael saw some of my work. I had nothing based on space, but he felt strongly that some of the things I was doing is exactly what the space uh, commercialization industry really needed. So I started working there and that was my first experience. Uh, the truth is it was, it was fun, it was challenging, it was interesting, but it was also quite young at the time. So uh, after a few years, we decided that I'm gonna return to Myanmar because I was also wanting to learn my own culture a little bit more. So I came back, uh, did a little bit of work here and there, and I realized I really needed a lot more education. Uh, the world is much bigger than I, than I thought it is. Uh, so right after that, I moved back to Australia at this time, so I'm a little bit closer to, to my own bird country as well. I did my bachelor's in industrial design, and I worked for a very, very amazing camping company because I wanted to, at the time, focus on humanitarian design, or like, how can I use design to help people? But there wasn't, again, like a little bit ahead at the time again, because there wasn't really a way to do that as a living and, and still make a decent income. So I moved into camping, which was parallel. Uh, all Basically, all the things I've learned from space and from, from uh, humanitarian design could really go into there as well. And afterwards, I, I was essentially minding my own business, and I saw an advertisement for a PhD program. It was incredibly competitive. It was, again, across oceans, my, my two cities. It was going to be across Melbourne, and it was going to be with Seattle. And let's have a look at someone to look into the aircraft cabin. Uh, it was coming back into the aerospace area and all, so it piqued all my interest. I didn't think I have a shot in hell. I applied for it and I got it. After I got it, that program turned out to be great. And this time around, after the PhD, I started becoming really interested in how I could bring all this together. Ideas about mobility, ideas about function, ideas about human health and enjoyment and, and usability. How do I bring it all into an area that I want to work on? This time around, third time's a charm. I've learned that if I really want to do something different, I can't just wait for the industry to be there. I need to sort of build a bit of a mentality around forging my own way as well. And that has worked out very well in the last few years. I've been able to focus on this strange very niche interest that I have of how do I look at human health and, and objects of mobility and to do that for a living. I'm running on a little bit, so I might hand it back over to you. Wonderful. No, I, I, um, I'm taken with your description of creating your own path, which um, is a very entrepreneurial way of thinking. And we, we hear that a lot from our guests on this program. Um, take us back, you, you were at Liftport, and then you got this other opportunity to work in aerospace. Tell us about the interplay between artists and engineers and how they benefit each other in the creative process of solving problems. Great question. Um, I think when you're an industrial designer, the world tend to have two views. The people who are more on the artistic side think you're, you're this robot person who, who just wants to destroy everything about creativity. People who are in the hard sciences, um, engineering or, or physics, think you make things look pretty, but perhaps choose a nice color on the toaster. Uh, I was very much in between and I've always been. What's very encouraging for me is when I started meeting people who are great scientists and great engineers, who are people who are really who really sort of had the experience of innovating and coming up with new ways, I learned that they really don't think like that at all. Um, in fact, I started meeting people who started saying that, you know, the STEM programs really need to be STEAM. We, we need to add art in there because there's, you get to a point where you need to think of things very, very differently. And that creativity really started to matter. It was really less of a challenge then than you might think. Most of the time when I have to explain why I belong at the table here, it's with someone who's not actually at the table. People who are actually working there already, they, they seem to have very little questions about why I am a contribution to, to the, work, the work that they're doing. 
That's wonderful. Inclusivity, teamwork. Um, it's it usually takes someone on the outside to start to think it's weird. <laughs> I think I think movies have really sort of ruined what the scientific community or what the artistic community is like because we can only show one character, right? Like artists are always reclusive and weird, and scientists are always up to something no good. Like what something bad is going to happen from from a group of scientists, or when in fact. That's, I, I don't think that's reality at all. I know it makes great fiction and I don't know if I want to fix it, uh, <laughs> but, but in reality, it is incredibly collaborative. It's a great point about how art imitates life and life imitates art in, if you include the movies uh, in that category. So really interesting point. You talk about uh, your inspirations uh, in the various media that are out there about you. You champion your wife and her contribution as a muse uh, and also your grandfather's legendary fame as a performing artist. Can you share a little bit with our audience about those muses, your mentors, your partners along the way? I've, I've, been, I've been very, very fortunate. The truth is, let's face it, right? Like, when you think of an industrial designer, great industrial designer, you don't think of Myanmar. And I'm not saying I'm not saying there's something wrong with you. It's just that I'm all, I'm from a culture that's been repressed for a long time. Uh, it's a culture that's been reclusive for a long time throughout history as well. And so, for long, you, you may associate Burmese people with craft, but when it comes to design, it hasn't been thought about. But somehow, even though I come from a background and such. I've been taken in by some really known figures um, around the world. Uh, some of my some of my colleagues and mentors now, Murray Kamins was a former head of design at Philips, and he was a VP at Teague. Daphne Flynn is a major, major, major person in the design world, uh, Philips uh, Asia. Mark Armstrong, one of my mentors again here, is one of the most awarded and influential industrial designers in Australia. But these are professionally, people who professionally guide me. And I thank them and I love them. I learned so much from them. But as an artist as well, you, you always find that the people in your life tend to have some of the most significant challenges. I am someone who, who has had such a blessing in life that my partner is not only supportive of what I do, she's also my muse. And, and I don't want to become you know, inappropriate on, on, on air here, but uh, I'm someone who also get to live this, this cross between my reality and my fantasy blending together in one person. And that's how, what I mean by she's my muse, right? Like my artwork of her are hardly ever, I mean, they're based on her, you know it's her, but like all art, there, there are elements that I've put in, some lines of fiction that I've decided, and, and they all blend together in this work. So she, I would say, is the biggest influence in my life because she's ongoing, she's in tech, uh, we're doing all this together, and she's also an artist. When it comes to history, I, I look back into my own history, and one of the things is, growing up, I was always told that my grandfather was a great dancer. I was always told that he was a great Burmese performer, the most famous Burmese um, theater performer ever. In fact, we call him the father of Burmese theater in the country. But I stopped there. My family stopped there as well. Like we never really looked more into it. It was only when I had formal research training and formal experience in innovation that I started looking up every piece of paper and mention and book that I can find on him and start reading up on it. And I realized this. I came across this very, very big question. Was someone just born to be creative and, and to be artistic, or did they have methodology? Is it methods? Is it talent? And that's when I started learning that you know, the world still has a bit of a frame that they want to put on people. So, for example, when it comes to Poe saying, we want to say that he's a great Burmese dancer. We don't, we don't want to acknowledge him as a great artist, period, across the board. That's something reserved for other people, perhaps, perhaps who are more famous in, in Hollywood or so. But when I started looking into it, I, I realized that his methods are truly universal. They could be applied anywhere. He was a nobody. He, he was born into a farmland. He learned how to dance from puppets because there was no one to teach him. And from there, he, he made his way into not just across Burma, but across Asia and the world. His innovations are endless, but one of the most creative things he's done is in logistics, not just performance. 
because of this logistic design that he's done in warehousing and clever use of sh shifting equipment from one place to another, historians conclude that people in Burma during his time saw more theater, live theater, than anyone else on the planet. So he was able to do these large shows at this alarming frequency across the country. One of the most recent things I found was in 2014, uh, Ted Sean, who was considered to be the father of American dance, uh, published his, uh, his memoir, his, his biography. And it was a real surprise. I was just wanting to read about dance. And I came across a little section where Ted Sean talked about how he traveled all the way to Burma back then to go and learn from this great Burmese idol, Po Seng, uh, on how Burmese dances happen and how Southeast Asian dance happens. And that really lit up my world to realize that, you know, once upon a time, there was this communication and collaboration between these two worlds that couldn't have been any more different. And it was mutually beneficial to both. Yeah. Yen, I am just, Bold over. I was trained in Dennis Sean method, yeah. Uh, yeah. modern dance, and that is Ted Sean uh, is one of those two names. Yeah. Um, so I may have danced some of the movements that your grandfather choreographed. Yeah. Um, Saint Dennis was also with Ted Sean yes. when they made. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's that's fascinating. Um, and it sounds as though you're not the only one who blends the engineering mind and the artist's mind uh, with his work in logistics. Yeah. Wow, what a what a wonderful story. And yeah. I feel such a personal connection with it. Thank you. Awesome. What have been some of the biggest challenges you've encountered in being an independent artist and designer? Yeah, um, I've always been so lucky that I've I've had you know my day job, my nine to five, and being able to to do some of the art and other I don't want to say questionable, but not so traditional design work independently. Um, and so the challenges are there, but I've also have had a lot of help. The obvious challenges are the learning curve of becoming a creative professional. You know, maintaining that while having to learn and bring in all the hard science and engineering stuff into my work. Sometimes it transfers, sometimes it doesn't because yeah. people who are writing papers and sharing their work, and they're not doing it on purpose. Like they're, they're usually, the system is set up for them to share knowledge, not necessarily techniques from time to time, but an artist really just can't work with an idea. Like sometimes when they talk about a very new structure, I, I need to read about how the structure came about. And that was hardly ever shared. Uh, and so just trying to rework those was always challenging. Finances are always a challenge. I've, I've always bought into the organizations I work with, and it's always hard for me when the financial success of the company is hit because that that's actually very relevant to how much we innovate and we do things as well. And then, of course, there's a matter of race, ethnicity, heritage. You know, like how many Burmese people do you see in research space or even industrial design? Um, yeah, so those are all challenging, but that not so obvious. But really, to me, the hardest challenge of that all is the one about creativity. It comes right back home. Um, it's look, you may have this idea of you know, you've been doing this for a living, you know, like you've got a handle on it. But let me tell you, I, I really don't. <laughs> like it's a it's an abstraction that is understood and accepted as a methodology, a talent, and an extraordinary and mythical force depending on who you speak to. You know, like grappling what creativity is and bringing that into research and the development of an actual technology and a product in the health and world or the space world, as well as taking it to make out, you know, like works of expression for myself. It's, it's a really difficult juggle. Um, but fortunately, they do have a pathway of coming together at the end of the day. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a passion that, that you're chasing and the challenge, the fact that you name the work itself as the biggest challenge rather than no oh, finding customers or this or that, um, just as how central it is to, to the work that you do and, and to the life that you lead. It's a cascade, right? Like the more, because yeah, it's a cascade. And, and if you don't have, if you're not thinking about that central core, nothing else really happens because it's not like, 
people who give you money to do the work you do are actually having money to throw around. No one does. They have, you know, even if they do, they have countless options. And for them to spend on something that you're doing, that there's got to be something that they want from you. Wonderful. Now we will take a short break for some great insight on what's happening at Space Foundation. Space Foundation is a nonprofit advocate organization offering gateways to information, education, and collaboration for space exploration and space-inspired industries that drive the global space ecosystem. Space Foundation, advocating for innovation, bettering life on Earth. Welcome back to our entrepreneurship interview with independent artist and designer, Dr. Nian Ong. Before the break, we talked about some of the challenges you've overcome. Now tell us about some of your biggest successes. Right. Uh, like a true artist, this one is also very, very difficult for me to answer. But co- going back to it, starting from my first work, when we when I started at Liftport, the idea of a space elevator was something that you had to explain to everyone you meet. Um, and some people walk away. Some people are intrigued. But today, the space elevator is a household concept now. And that's really major for me. Uh, I, I felt that Michael had a huge hand in doing that. And he brought me along in visualizing that. And that's major for me. I, I don't know if I want to, if I want to list out all the awards and projects right now, I think 20 years from now, you don't remember the projects. You remember the people around you while you were doing the project. For example, there's a lot of great stuff going on right now, but the most overwhelming thoughts in my head are about Tintin, my wife and our, and our nine month old son, Yo-Yo. I, I guess the fact that I'm here right now, you know, the fact that you want to talk to a designer and an artist about their take on on space and humanity, space future, um, and I get to represent my colleagues who who are designers and artists. That's that's really a big success for me. Wonderful, um, and you've talked a little bit about your customers and and your focus on their needs. Talk about how you go about finding a new customer for our aspiring entrepreneurs it's careers go in a weird trajectory in the beginning you you go and look for people because you have to explain yourself advocate for yourself and then around your mid-career so i i guess i'm also trying to be very encouraging to others who are doing it you do get to a point where people start looking for you um, there's a great line in the in the Wes Anderson movie, uh, The Grand Budapest Hotel, where he talks about writers. He thinks writer, you know, you think writers are out there looking for stories, but the truth is, the stories come and find you. Uh, but you will get to a point where people come and find you, and that's where things become interesting because people literally start buying your time and trading your time. Sometimes they start making deals amongst themselves on who gets to approach whom at the time. So, so hang in there. Um, clients are out there, but it doesn't just happen. That's important as well. So, let me go. Let me go a little bit into it. Basically. I'm assuming that those who are interested in a podcast like this are most likely interested in entrepreneurship around technology and exploration. So whatever the area you're looking at, whether you're looking at um, habitat modules or radar systems, every technology goes in three steps, exploration, efficacy, and experience. Yeah, Exploration is you're out here and, and you want to figure out how something may look like. It's very experimental. And at the time, you're tempted to think only about technology. But then you quickly realize that, okay, I have a proof of concept. Now I need to think about how am I actually going to make this work in the world? And that, when you start to kind of like narrow things down on what's actually manufacturable, what can you actually mass produce, what can you actually source? And in the end, you'll very quickly realize that you always need to think about experience, right? Like, because what's the point of your product if the end user is not experiencing it correctly? And you'll find that no matter how great your exploration is, how viable it is, if you can't deliver that experience in the things, it, it just wouldn't go ahead. What's fortunate today is people are realizing that that experience is important and designers and artists are very good at creating that experience, but we can't leave it to the end anymore. 
because we, there's too much risk of that not working out at the end. So they're starting to bring in experience to the front end of exploration. And that's where things are starting to be. So that's not just me trying to share a theory. That's trying to come back to me saying that always look for people who are aware of this, especially if you're a creative. If someone is not aware and are not convinced that they need to think about the human experience from the get go, they are probably not gonna change your mind for you. And those who are thinking about it, it's it's almost like, I mean, I don't know what a good example is. They're looking for you and you're looking for them. So you just gotta keep an eye out on that and always try to be aware of, if you wanna work on a certain technology, what stage it's, it's at, or what component is at what stage. And that way you also know how to, how to approach. Um, in, if something is still an exploratory, like some of the projects I'm working on, we really try to focus on my experience and knowledge as a researcher and, and a creative researcher. When something is in an efficacy sort of stage, I come to kind of um, highlight on my, my knowledge and experience with human factors and with usability and with testing. And when someone's really thinking about the end, the, the experience again, we, we come back to, because I, I, I try not to ever shy away from my interest in form and aesthetics as well. And we try to bring that in. Yeah. You are probably the first uh, to talk on this this uh, podcast or a series of interviews about screening customers and how to perhaps uh, weed through the ones who wouldn't be aligned with with the work that that needs to be done. So, really fascinating response there. Thank you. Do you have any additional advice for aspiring entrepreneurs uh, in their their travels? Yeah, um, I'm I'm not sure what's really been. You know, there, there's two tools um, that I always focus on, right? Like, and I think you'll find enough books out there on how to do marketing, how to do self promotion. But but there are two tools that I always tend to rely on. And those are positivity and, and creativity. And if you think I got that from Star Trek, I didn't. I did. That's from Star Trek. But anyway, um, those two are really important to me. To, to maintain your positivity, to see how the world comes together, even when, you know, it, it's good to know that the world is moving at least somewhat in the right direction at the end of the day. And to maintain that positivity and to always rely on your creativity. I, I think when it comes to creativity, unfortunately, even now, even after we have so much evidence, uh, our school teachers and our parents still think it's about painting. It, it's really not. Creativity is everywhere. Creativity is in the sciences. Creativity is in business. Creativity really is something that you need to rely on and, and you need to learn how to use as a tool. Wonderful. Um, with applying that creativity across the board, tell us about the importance of advocacy and awareness about space. Yeah. Uh, it, it relates, well, okay, let, let me come back to this. Um, it actually somewhat relates to the finance question. Actually, it, Right, like because humanity is really concerned about that finance question: is it going to be, is it going to make money? But that's why I might take a little bit of a break here because I find that finance sometimes is a real question and oftentimes is an excuse. Hear me out. When someone doesn't want to do projects that are based on sustainability, they just say no, but it's not financially viable, and you know it's not going to work. It doesn't, you know, the numbers don't add up even though we have countless evidence of people who did think about that, who did approach that, and the numbers do add up. And in fact, it's more, it can be worse than you think. Like there are times where we bring up um, trying to add in features and changes for accessibility. And people argue, yeah, but I gotta think about the finances. I can't take care of everyone. We, you know, if you look at curb cuts uh, around every neighborhood, it's changed everyone's lives. It's not just about one, you know, just with people with wheelchairs, prams, shopping carts, everything. And it hasn't damaged any developer in whatsoever way, uh, but people use that excuse a lot. But it does, let's face it, come back to the finance question. So oftentimes it comes to appealing to the fact that, you know, space advocacy is, it's actually everything. It 
space is, you know, this is this has been said by everybody, but space exploration is the only thing we do together peacefully as humanity. Let's face it, it, it helps us work towards a goal and a common vision that all of us can share. And so we have to, like we're, we are an extra, extraplanetary species and we need to think about our extraplanetary pathways. And I, as a creative professional, am always thinking about this really weird term, extraplanetary design. I am reminded in your um, discussion about, um, I heard that you wrote a book about yourself uh, when you were about 18 years old. And um, you talked about just different characteristics that you had. Can you tell me one little tidbit from that book now that you've evolved into such a fascinating and accomplished human being? I I, I think you may have heard that from Michael. It, it probably wasn't actually a book. Uh, I so <laughs> when I when I showed up to uh, Michael Lane's office for an interview, I I what I had in my backpack was not a bunch of books or or you know thoughtful things. I had a couple of comic books and a whole lot of rap CDs. Um, we still use CDs back then, by the way. Um, and so I, I was very immature and it was part of my way of trying to figure out, you know, like, what do I want to do? Where am I headed? I think when I was younger, I, I also had very limited vision of the world. And I think a big tidbit was I was very passionate about design and art, but, but I was almost only thinking of it as the only thing that matters. And so there would have been very strong over the top ideas about how one should pursue art above all things at all costs. Uh, that's changed a little bit for me now. Now it's changed a lot for me now um, to understand that now we actually need everyone together for all of these areas. Thank you so much, Nian, for sharing your journey with us today. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's been fantastic. If you're interested in learning more about our space commerce program or watching other entrepreneurship interviews, go to spacefoundation.org and check out our space commerce series under our Center for Innovation and Education. Thank you and we look forward to seeing you again. There's a place for you in the new global space ecosystem.